I want to ask you the question here tonight, and you don't have to answer it out loud or anything, but I want you to think about this. How would you live your life if you knew what was going to happen tomorrow? If you knew the events that were going to take place? What if it was about 20 years down the line you knew what was going to be happening? What if it's 100 years down the line? We're all promised. Every single human being on the planet is promised that there is a day of judgment that is coming. A day when we'll stand before the throne of God and we'll give an account for what we've done in this life. Are you living your life like that's the truth? George Mueller, he was an evangelist and an orphan manager. Some of y'all may have heard some of the miraculous tales he's told. He's told he would sit down, he'd pray in the morning because the kids didn't have any milk. Uh, a, a milk uh, truck, or I guess it was a cart back then, would break down and they'd have to bring the milk in because the milk would have went sour. All because this man, he got down and prayed and God provided for these orphans in this orphanage. Well, as I say, he did many, there was many miraculous things happened through his ministry. One person came and asked him one time, said, what's the secret of these miracles that God's accomplished in your life? What made all the difference about all these things? And this is what George said. He said, there was a day when I died. I utterly died, died to George Mueller. His opinions, his preferences, his tastes, and will died to the world of its approval or its censure, died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends, he said. And since then, I have studied to show myself approved only to God. That's the only approval he needed. That was all that really mattered. And if you think about it, that's all that really matters in any of our lives when it comes down to it. I promise you it will be the most, most important thing to you one second after you died, how you dealt with God in this life. Now, we've been studying through 2 Timothy. And, of course, this is a letter that was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to his young protege, Timothy. He was a young pastor that Paul was mentoring within the faith. And Paul is uh, writing in this letter uh, to him from prison. It's in a bad place where he's at. And this is also near the end of his life. He's going to be martyred here soon. And so this letter is kind of Paul's passing off of his mission on to Timothy that God had given to him. And this letter reveals uh, the things that a man on a mission uh, from God is concerned about uh, near the end of his life. Matter of fact, a man on a mission from God, it shows what he's concerned about all of his life, doesn't it? Things like he, he, he wants to warn his loved ones of future trouble, make sure they're prepared to handle it. And tonight, we're going to conclude this letter with a charge that's given to Timothy. Y'all know what a charge is? Not a charge like you get a battery or a, a, a charge as if you're going with a group uh, of horses and you're attacking. A, a charge, as he's talking about here tonight, is an official giving of a task. A, a commission to do something. This is my charge to you. Now, have you ever been charged before? I promise you, if you're a follower of Christ tonight, you have a charge. You have a charge. We're going to get into that, what that is. So if you'll turn over in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy, excuse me, chapter 4. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, a strong belief that history will culminate in Christ appearing with the judgment and the final establishment of his kingdom will make a profound difference upon your life if you really do believe that. If you really do believe that, it's going to make a difference in how you live your life.
Now it says here that Jesus is going to judge the quick. What's the quick? In Old English, that's the living. The living. And and, uh, I believe Paul is saying here, literally, the only living is the saved, right? We're we're full living. We're body, soul, and spirit. A Christian is fully saved, so they're fully living. And the dead. In the idea, the lost. The quick and the dead. He's charging him here before uh, who shall, uh, Jesus Christ is going to judge the uh, Christians and he's going to judge the lost people as appearing at his kingdom. Now the lost are judged on their works. And all our works are as filthy rags is what Isaiah tells us. None of your works are ever going to get you into heaven. No good work gets a man into heaven because we're, we're not... We're not perfect. We can't get into heaven on our own good works. Uh, they can't save them, but they will be judged upon what they've done. The saved are judged on works too, but not for their salvation. There will come a day when you'll stand before the king and you'll be judged on the works that you did in this life for Jesus Christ. You may not have known that here before tonight. Now, I've heard a lot of people, they say, really? I mean, what does it matter? I'm saved. I'm going my own way. I said, you didn't ever get saved. If that's your concern. Because there's a difference in how you live your life if you got saved, right? Um, There are rewards, though, for those who live for Christ's kingdom. And it speaks all that about different crowns that people get, different things that people get. And it speaks there about that that Bema Seat judgment, if you ever read that in Scripture, where, where you'll stand up and there'll be these rewards given to the saints. Is what the scripture tells us. Now now listen to what this means. It means that every single one of us, whether you're lost or whether you're saved, you're accountable unto God, aren't you? You're going to be accountable one day. Many live, live their whole lives and don't ever grasp that profound truth. How important that is. That God cares what I'm doing here on this little speck in all these different galaxies all around. I'm going to be judged on what my little speck here, me, did in this life that God gave me. And one day we'll stand before Him. Now, in view of God's future reward, He says, Timothy should preach the Word. Why? Because he's one of the quick. He's one of the saved. He's one of the living, right? He needs to preach the Word. He shouldn't preach his feelings or his projects, but the Word of God, right? Uh, Why? Because God loves people. And he knows this is the most important task that anyone can be given. Right now, I'm preaching the Word to you. I'm teaching the Word to you. They're they're kind of more in the same sometimes. But, But the idea is I'm doing the most important thing that anybody can do for all of eternity. And you can do this as well. You can go and tell your friends and loved ones about Jesus. You can sit down with your children each night and teach them the Word of God, can't you? We can all do this. We can all do this. And this is important that we do do this. The only task that will matter at that final judgment is what you did for Christ with your life. Maybe you taught him by going out and working out in the field and helping your neighbor bring in the hay, right? And they knew you were a Christian and they weren't, and that preached the gospel to them, didn't it? There's lots of different ways to preach the word, isn't there? Lots of different ways. But in the end, though, it's not going to matter, all these passing concerns. We get so held up on all the little things, don't we? Little things. It ain't going to matter two minutes, let alone 2,000 years. Little things. Now, all that matters here is the charge given by God to us all. And this is the charge each and every one of y'all have, okay? In Mark 16, it tells it. It says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what Jesus Christ said to us all, right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we should do this with a sense of urgency, he says. Taking every opportunity. There's a lot of y'all that like to hunt deer. I know some of y'all went hunting deer before. And uh, when you do that, there's a time when the authorities will allow you to go hunt deer. And there's a time when the authorities will not allow you to go hunt deer. There's a time when it's in season. And there's a time when it's out of season, right? Now... um, Right now, it would seem that preaching of the Word of God is like it says there in those verses, out of season, right? It's not convenient to preach the Word of God out here today. You're not getting a pat on the back to go preach the Word of God out here today. People don't look at you no different out here today. Matter of fact, they might look on you a little worse today if you go out and you preach the Word of God right now, right? People don't want to hear the Word of God out here today. They don't want to give it any authority within their lives today. 
But actually, there are very few times in history when it has been in season, if you think about it, all right? It's hardly ever been convenient to be able to preach the Word of God. We've lived in some seasons, I think, in our lives where it was convenient, where they would actually have a preacher come into the school. They'd hand out New Testaments to the children in the school. That's totally gone now. That's out of season, right? Out of season, set aside. But he says we've got to preach in season or out of season because there's a sense of urgency. That people need to hear this word. And as a servant of Christ, Timothy is called upon to do what? To reprove. What's reprove mean? It means to convince. You've got to give a logical argument for what the scriptures say. You've got to give a good reasoning in what this word of God says. What does that require? It requires you study it. It requires you know it, right? It'll come out in your life if you study over it. I promise you that. You'll see it in how you act and how you interact with other people. Uh, also, we have to rebuke what is false. We need to stand against these wrong teachings in our society here today, right? We need to be able to rebuke that with the Word of God. He also be required to exhort, to exhort, or the other words, to encourage, to encourage sinners to repent, those who are lost to repent, and for the saints to keep the faith, to keep the faith, to keep going forward. And in all of this, he has to be unfailing in his patient long-suffering. Because I promise you, whether you're preaching in season or you're preaching out of season, you're going to have some long-suffering. You're going to have to deal with some trial, tribulation, and trouble. Jesus said all those who are godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, right? All who are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So you're going to face that. And you also got to make sure you're faithfully teaching the sound doctrine. Now, this can't be just the pastor. Some people think that. Well, when he said, go ye in all the world, he's just talking about the preacher. No, he wasn't. He's talking about every single one of us is called to go out here and do this. If the pastor doesn't keep those qualities, though, uh, the whole church will suffer. But each of us must strive to fulfill these qualities in our ministries before the Lord. Now, why is that imperative? Look here at the next few verses, verse 3 through 5 here. He says, for the time will come. Remember, this is in the first century. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, that means that they got to itch back here and they got to scratch it. They want somebody to make it feel better, make their ears feel good. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of thy ministry. So Paul gives two strong reasons here for the charge that he's just given to old Timothy. And the first is there's going to be a general turning away from wholesome doctrine. He says here, these churches that we've been assembling here in the first century, many of them are going to go the wrong way. There will only be a remnant that holds on to the truth. And they're going to get filled up with false teachings. So if you're concerned about the final judgment coming, you better be concerned that you and your family are hearing the right teachings on what the Bible truth is. <laughs> right? Some of us think that it's okay to sit and listen to false teaching and, and uh, just sit in the midst of that. Friends, if you're in a church that's teaching false teaching, you need to come out. All right? <laughs> come out from among them. Right? Go away from that mess. If they don't hear when they're young and even you might get distracted, it might hurt you on the judgment day. Right? There's a reward coming, right? For those who are quick and living in Christ Jesus. And even worse, for somebody you're tagging along with you and they're lost and they sit in that false mess, what's going to happen? Well, they, they might open up their eyes in hell one day, right? If they don't repent and come to the Lord. So this church, the church we're in here tonight, is based on what the Bible says a church should be simple. Just by what... The New Testament says by the Bible. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people don't know the history of the church and how it went. You see, right now, all those churches that are over there in Jerusalem and stuff, a lot of them are called Eastern Orthodox right now. Now, they filled up with traditions over the years. They got away from the truth of the Word of God. And at some point, they had like, um, I think about seven different heads of these churches. And one of them was the man who was over in Rome. And that guy on Rome, he was the Pope, and he was the head among equals. Until one day, he got kind of a fool of himself, 
And he said, I'm above all the equals, and you have to listen to me. And the Eastern Orthodox Church split from the Roman Catholic Church, is what we call it now. Now, in all of this, there were true believers scattered about in the midst of it, right? But the church got far and far away from what the simple New Testament told about the church. It strayed away from that. I went to an Eastern Orthodox church just to see what it was like one time. Come in and see that, and there was incense, and there was all these different things. And I looked into that and said, is this the original church? Is this what the original church was Because if it is, that's where I should be, right? If it is. But it wasn't. As I studied over these things, the most important thing you can think about in the Bible is how to be what, church? Saved. Saved, right? That's the first point. How do we get saved? Well, the Bible tells us very simply, we're saved by grace through faith, right? Now, orthodoxy denies penal substitution. What's penal substitution? That's a big word, Scott. Well, that's the idea that Jesus was our substitute for our sins upon the cross. And he is made into more of like the ultimate example in Eastern Orthodoxy in how to become like God. But the idea of, of trusting in his sacrifice for us as our substitutes denied. Years of tradition caused them to set that aside, set that off the way. Catholicism. Catholicism says to trust in Jesus, but it also says you must do these sacraments in order to uh, keep your salvation in order to have your salvation. Jesus says, though, we are eternally saved and that true salvation is simply by God's grace through simple faith in His sacrifice for me. And that makes all the difference. That makes all the difference. Now, that changes who I am, but I don't change myself to keep it. It makes a difference. It's a free gift. I was told when I was a young man, when I got saved, the Scripture came to me and it said, my, well, my dad told it to me, Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we don't do anything to earn that salvation. It's a free gift given to us. And what an awesome truth that that is. An awesome truth. Another thing it says here, that these churches over time, they'll go after fables. Uh, the churches began speaking to the dead. That's a thing in the Old Testament that was told as being forbidden. Uh, that this newly created idea of a saint as being someone to go ask for help instead of God actually began in the 300s. It will not seem within the Bible. So the early church did not do this. And this new doctrine conveniently took the place of pagans coming in the church. And instead of praying to all sorts of gods, they prayed to all sorts of different saints. Uh, so that kind of fulfilled those itching ears, didn't it? Even those around us all fall into false doctrines and fables. We must do the work of an evangelist to keep the Word of God as our proof for how Jesus set up His simple church. It says here, make full proof of thy ministry. If we're saved, we'll continue in the truth, even when all others abandon it. We must continue with the truth of the Word of God. This is the most important thing, the most important thing for all of eternity. Now, the second reason for the charge that Paul's uh, time of departure is at hand is this. He's, he's, he's about to, to find his death here. Look here at verse 6 through 8. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Now listen to what Paul says here. He's considering his death. You know how Paul's going to die here? He's going to die at the hands of uh, the emperor Nero, a, a bisexual. Uh, all of the, uh, most of the emperors of Rome were either homosexual or bisexual. And Nero was going to have his head cut off. And that's what he's talking about, his offering here to God. He's offering up his life. Why would anyone give up their life? Why would anyone do that? Because of that crown of righteousness. Remember, everything is about that. Everything is about that moment. You're going to stand before Christ and you're going to look him in the eye. And it'll be about that judgment that takes place. If you truly love his appearing, you will live your life accordingly. If you truly love His appearing. 
Look here at verse 9. Verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, he tells Timothy. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed into Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Antiochus have I sent to Ephesus the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus. When thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially, he says, the parchments. Because everything is about the end. What would you do if you found yourself in a prison awaiting your execution? What would you do? If everything is really about the moment you're going to stand before Christ one day, what would you do? Paul says this is what he does. He says, give me a Bible while I'm sitting in prison. Bring me a Bible. Bring the books. Bring the parchments. Can you get somebody to help me in the ministry while I'm in here jail so you can send somebody out here? Can you get Mark? He's good for me. Because another guy, a false follower, he, he left me, Demas. He left me. I'd also like a coat so I can stay healthy in my remaining days to do ministry here. All of these things. His mind is on the prize, isn't it? His mind is on the moment he's going to stand before God, right? Even to the very last minute. Is that how you would react while you're waiting for your execution? You ever think about that? How would you act while you were waiting for your execution? Be a lot of things on your mind, but it would be would it be doing the ministry of God while you're sitting there in a prison cell? It isn't about him. It isn't about his comfort. It's about the mission that God has given him. Go on to verse 14. It says, Alexander the coppersmith, he's talking about something that happened to him, one of the reasons he's here. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou ware also. For he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it not, may not be laid to their charge. Now, how do you treat your enemies when you know the end of the story? How do you treat your enemies? Well, Paul recognized there's an end of the story for old Alexander here. Alexander uh, was a fella, uh, gave him a bunch of trouble. According to 1 Timothy 1.20, it seemed he was actually a former member of the church that gave him all this trouble and kept standing against him. He tells, he tells Timothy, beware of this guy. But he recognizes there's an end of the story for old Alexander too. He says, may the Lord repay him according to his works, right? May the Lord repay him for what he did to me. How much easier it would be if we could all live, if we remembered that God will judge these false followers around him one day. God's going to take care of all everything. We get worried about everybody else around us. We get worried about everything going on. When in reality, all we got to worry about is ourselves and, and what God wants from us, right? He also recognizes there's an end for those who don't help him. There's these people who could have helped him out when he got thrown in prison, but they didn't help him out. And then what does he do? What would you do? Would you say, well, I, man, I hope God just destroys them for that. No, Paul knew they were afraid and they didn't know what to do. So he prays that God doesn't put that on their final report card for them, right? He says, don't lay that to their charge. Paul has relayed the physical problems he had of been having while awaiting his execution, his future judgment here. Now he's going to relay the unseen solution that was placed in place that gave him hope. There's nothing greater than this. Listen to what it says in verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom, to him whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, when you know the end, it also affects how you see the past. You understand? You see those times? Do you think about it, church? Do you think about those times when the Lord protected you? I can remember back when I was a young man, I'd get in all sorts of sin. I'd get out and I got drunk. And you know what I'd do? I'd jump in a car and I'd drive. And I'd be driving down these curvy roads. And you know, by all, all reasoning, I should have run off the road and died. I should have been dead somewhere a long time ago. I was in sin. I deserved it, didn't I? I deserved to be that to happen to me. But God was there and He was watching over me. Can you remember a time? 
when God was watching over you in the trials that you went through. Can you remember that? When you look back, you can see those things, how God stepped in. He did something when you didn't know what to do. Those times, those times like that, those are good things to take and stick in your pocket, right? Because you're going to have Alexander the coppersmith come up. He's going to cause you trouble. He's going to get you thrown off into some jail cell somewhere. And you're going to be sitting there and you're going to be held up and not be able to do the mission like you're supposed to do. Well, remember, it's always God that was taking me through all this anyway, right? It's always God. He goes on to say, he goes on to say here, Salute Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, Pris Prissa and Quilla is what it says there. And the house of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Militum sick. Remember, this is a letter. This is just him explaining out things. Do thy diligence to come before winter, he asked Timothy. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Now finally here, we recognize our future isn't simply built upon us. We need to work together. Can I tell you something? There are no Lone Ranger Christians. <laughs> no Lone Ranger Christians. Paul wasn't out here doing everything himself. And you're not going to be out here doing everything yourself either. You need to be within the church. You need to be within the congregation working together to see God's mission done. Not my mission. Not my thing. You know, sometimes people get territorial about things in the church, right? They get territorial. This is my thing. Oh, no. This is all our thing, right? We're all in a mission together to do God's work. So Paul here, he names several names. I, I don't know who all these people were. This is some of these that are only mentioned here in all of Scripture. Uh, I mean, Putin's lines, Claudia, different names like that are here. But he's showing here at the end, we need one another to complete the charge that's been given to us. We need one another to prepare for the judgment that's coming, right? We need one another to be able to receive that reward is, that is coming. Are you prepared, church? Are you living your life like one day you're going to stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords? That should be the first thing you think of the moment you wake up in the morning. That should be the last thing you think about as you lay your head on the pillow at night that one day I'm going to stand before Him. And I'm going to say, Lord, I love You so much that You died upon that cross for me so long ago. You shed Your blood as a substitute for my sins. You made all the difference in my life, Lord, and I give all that right back to You. Why, to earn it? By no means, no. <laughs> but because I love You. Because I love You. And that makes all the difference. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and subscribe to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 1030 and I hope you'll make plans to join us.